Ja, herzlich willkommen zu unserer ja, kleinen mein Name ist Katharina Nukon, ich arbeite als Campaignerin bei Campact und bin dort vor allem für die Bürgerrechte und Datenschutzkampagne. Ja, und ich bin Marita Strasser, auch Campaignerin bei Campact und da seit einem Jahr für das Thema TTIP und die Europäische Bürgerinitiative ähm, zuständig. Campact ähm, ist ein Bürgernetzwerk, eine Bürgerbewegung, die online und offline miteinander verbindet, um mit dem Ziel, einen politischen Wandel in eine progressive Richtung voranzubringen. Die schöne neue Welt der Handelsabkommen, die wir vorstellen, ähm, da sind ähm, vier Abkommen äh, benannt. Die Bullets sind wieder nicht das richtig. Sind vier gerade. Es sind acht Bullets, aber nur vier Abkommen. Naja, egal. Ähm, es werden noch mehr. <lacht> wir sagen übrigens nie Freihandelsabkommen dazu. Das Wort Freihandelsabkommen ist Ideologie und Beschönigung. Es geht bei diesen, allen diesen Abkommen, die ihr hier seht auf dieser Folie, geht es um die Verrechtlichung neoliberaler Politik. Es geht darum, neoliberale Politik, die in den letzten Jahrzehnten reichlich erfolglos gewesen ist, zu verstetigen und gegen demokratische Entscheidungen rechtlich abzusichern. Das ist die Agenda dahinter. Und wir werden euch gleich das Details dazu zeigen. Und wir euch gleich Details dazu zeigen. Die meisten dieser Abkommen werden vollkommen geheim verhandelt, jahrelang, und dann überfallartig verabschiedet, ratifiziert, ohne dass irgendjemand irgendwas davon weiß, die Abgeordneten, die darüber entscheiden, eingeschlossen. Das meiste oder vieles von dem, was wir wissen, beruht daher auf Leaks, durch Whistleblower gezwitschert worden. Ja, das ist die Grundlage das unserer Arbeit. Das ist die Grundlage unserer Arbeit. Ja, wenn wir über Handelsabkommen reden, dann ähm, sollten wir direkt zum Kern des Problems vorstoßen. Und das sind die unseligen Investorstaatklagen, die in den meisten dieser Handelsabkommen drin sind. Ähm, Investorstaatklagen werden auch kurz mit dem ähm, niedlichen Kürzel ISDS Abgekürzt, ISDS steht für Investor State Dispute ähm, Settlement und das bedeutet, dass den einzelnen Konzernen in, die in den Staaten, die in den Verträgen beteiligt sind, ähm, wirtschaftlich tätig sind, erlaubt wird, vor Gericht zu ziehen gegen einen der Vertragspartner, also einen der beiden Staaten, der in dem Fall unterzeichnet. Nehmen wir mal beispielsweise TTIP. Also TTIP ist ein Abkommen, der, äh, das zwischen der EU und den USA abgeschlossen ist. Also die Regierung, also die EU-Kommission und die Regierung der USA. Vertragsparteien sind aber nicht Konzerne. Interessanterweise erlauben die allerdings, dass Rechte eingeräumt werden, ohne dass sie irgendwelche Rechte Kümmer dich um Umweltstandards, ähm, sei transparent und korrupt. Nee, darum geht es in solchen Abkommen nicht. Es geht nur darum, ähm, Investoren zusätzliche Möglichkeiten zu haben. Das bedeutet also, wenn wir einen Konzern haben, der in einem Beispielsfall, sag ich mal, nehmen wir mal ein deutsches Unternehmen, das heißt, ein Unternehmen könnte mit so einem Schiedsgericht kommen, obwohl in den USA solche Unternehmen weil man jeden Ja, und warum regen wir uns über diese vollkommene Privatisierung des dass jederzeit vor diesem zusätzlichen Gremium geklagt werden das kann. Das heißt, ein Unternehmen, was in irgendeiner Weise muss nicht den nationalen Rechtsstaat ja schon gibt, also es braucht keine Handelsabkommen, um den Staat zu verklagen. Das kann man schon nicht. Aber das Interessante an dieser Taste ist eben, dass man den Staat aufgrund anderer Klauseln verklagen kann, die im normalen Rechtsweg nicht vorgesehen sind. Und so, ich denke, dass du kannst du eigentlich, dass du hier 
Ich kann nur mal sagen, also diese drei Personen, die ihr da auf der Grafik sehen, die haben Hüte auf, die können jeweils tauschen von Verfahren zu Verfahren. Also wer in einem Verfahren die Klägerseite vertreten kann, kann im nächsten Verfahren der Richter sein oder die Seite des Klagens vertreten. Bei diesen DSDS-Klagen gibt es einen Großteil aller Klagen weltweit machen. Die unterschiedlichen wechselnden Rollen sind immer dieselben. Daraus entstehen natürlich auch Interessenkonflikte. Es gibt auch einen sogenannten Ehrenkodex, den er nicht verbindlich ist und darüber hinaus ist in, in, in diesem Pseudokodex noch nicht mal festgelegt, was der Interessenkonflikt ist. Das heißt, die Leute sind also, das ist immer so, die Privatpersonen, die, die, die kriegen auch nur Geld und dann sehr viel Geld, wenn es Klagen gibt. Äh, sie werden, das gibt dann sechsstellige Summen pro Verfahren, was sie da verdienen, sie werden richtig reich dran. Also sie haben ein ökonomisches Interesse, möglichst viele Klagen zu haben und deshalb diese ganzen Verträge möglichst extensiv auszulegen. Teilweise gehen die Kanzleien, äh, denen die angehören, aktiv auf Mandantensuche, du klag doch mal und da könntest du und hier könntest du machen. Also die Kanzleien haben ein Beratungsgeschäft. Als Konzern aus. Ich fühle mich auch aus irgendeinem Grund ungerecht behandelt. Ähm, und da kommt der Anwaltskanzlei auf mich zu und sagt: so, ja, Hast du schon mal von ISDS gehört? Das ist eine ganz tolle neue Möglichkeit. Ähm, da kannst du klagen. Dann tritt folgender Fall ein, wenn eine Klage eingereicht wird. Ähm, sowohl der Kläger als auch der Beklagte sucht sich einen Schiedsrichter. So. Ähm, und dann zusammen einigen sie sich auf einen Dritten. Und Gemeinsam, also so ein, so ein Urteil muss immer mit einer Mehrheit gesprochen werden. Meistens werden sie sich aber auch so in den Konsens einig. Das heißt, so Recht als Verhandlungslösung. Um mal einen Vergleich zu nehmen, wenn ich jemand wegen einer Urheberrechtssache in Deutschland ankriegen will und ähm, ich habe irgendwelche Urheberrechte an irgendwelchen Sachen und ich arbeite für Frauen oder sonst was, dann gehe ich normalerweise nach Hamburg, weil ich weiß, in Hamburg ist die Rechtsprechung ähm, relativ, äh, sag ich mal, auf Seite der, der Urheber, der, der Nutzungsrechteinhaber und weniger auf der Seite der Nutzer. Also ich kann mir aber den Richter natürlich nicht aussuchen. Also das, das wäre ein Witz, wenn ich mir, wenn ich sagen könnte, so nee, der Richter passt mir nicht. Und ähm, zusätzlich kann auch noch der Beklagte in Berufung gehen, wenn ihm das Urteil nicht passt, was ja in Hamburg oft der Fall ist. Dann geht man eben in die nächste Instanz und hat die Möglichkeit, eben dieses Urteil zurückzurudern. Und interessanterweise fehlt diese Möglichkeit bei den ähm, Schiedsrichtern. Okay, we may have had some issues here with technology. I'm very sorry about that. So you, you've probably missed the start of our translation, and um, we are going to try and get into the talk now. Um, this is about investor-state dispute settlement within the framework of what they call free trade agreements, which uh, our speakers have ca called an ideo ideological term. Um, and we're just going to get into the translation now. Um, to make the thing more tangible, I'd like to tell a small story from Romania from the 90s, the 1990s, just after the fall of communism, two brothers, the, the Nikola brothers, thought that they would buy a Swedish drinks co conglomerate. And the filling um, the plants, we could run cheaply in Romania and make a lot of profit. And of course, that was true. It was a fantastic business, especially because the Romanian government was quite generous. Uh, taxes on profits were not uh, liable, they were not to be paid. and. Um, uh, and import tariffs, oh well, who cares? Now, now while we're at it, let's waive them as well. Um, but then the Romanian government at one point said that they would like to join the EU, the European Union, become a member state. And during the negotiations, it turned out that some of these, well, let's say, state subsidies, um, or we could call that another kind of business as well, that that was actually not compatible with the law. And the Romanian government and the EU uh, had, to, had to, as it was a, in the process of applying to the EU, they had to remove those. Of course, the two brothers didn't like that. So what then do you do in, in a situation like that? It's, of course, very interesting to use this path, ISDS. What they did was they used a French top lawyer from, from the ISDS uh, community, as, as it were, 
And on the basis of a bilateral ISDS agreement between Sweden and Romania, they went they went to one of these arbitration panels in Washington, where that was based, and they won. And uh, they argued that, well, we relied on, on these um, <laughs> rebates on, um, that, to, to remain forever, and, and we were expecting that. And, uh, and yes, the, the panel agreed. This was completely surprising. Uh, why does the government suddenly start to regulate the economy? So you received 250 million, was it 250 million? dollars from, from, from the government. And that's where things get interesting, because the EU, EU Commission told the Romanian government not to hand over that money. That is absurd, the EU Commission said. This is a democratically elected parliament wanting to, to conform to the law and having to pay a, a fine for that. No, don't do that. And that same EU Commission is now negotiating several trade agreements with exactly such clauses. Well. And what is particularly dramatic is um, cases where the going really gets tough. If we have states that are short before bankruptcy and, and after years of liberalization and privatization um, um, with all the kinds of promises that didn't turn out to be true, gets into a crisis, wants to cut their debts uh, and take a few things back from private, the privatized sector, that's, of course, when things get difficult, because that's when the ISDS clauses come into force. In the case of Greece, it was interesting. Uh, there were some law firms that um, um, went to their clients and said, well, you know, there's a debt cut being negotiated. So if, if you have a company seated in, in any country that could be uh, become grounds for an ISDS um, procedure, we could deal with that, or we could actually just threaten uh, dealing, uh, going to those panels uh, to influence the negotiations and get more out from those negotiations to the companies. And the um, one country, Argentina, for example, that is that's, that's really down in dumps now. Uh, they did have a debt cut, and more than 40 of such procedures were then hoisted onto them, and and a single of these could be about a billion in volume. And of course, that could get the crisis really deeper. And uh, Argentina, the state, said during its crisis, people are losing their work. They don't know how they should pay their bills. And, and so we will fix prices for water and energy so that people just can barely survive. And then a water company comes along and says, we want a fine. We want we want to claim damages. Damages of for what, you could ask. And risks and side effects, uh, it's not just us that pay, it's also our uh, successors, uh, our de descendants. Um, it can take up to 20 years for an investor to to start a procedure like this after after the event. Yeah, um, right, uh, that's the hardware. These arbitration panels are the hardware, and the code that's running on this hardware is, is this. This is an extract from such an invest in investor state protection agreement from CETA, the European-Canadian agreement, um, Article X9, uh, the right that guarantees every investor it's, these rights are listed from A to F, items that you could, uh, that, that are part of this. And this list is something that the EU Commission is, is terribly proud of because they said that this very flexible clause that says, well, the, 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 those scandalous clauses that have always that always been named by critics, they replaced that by this closed and, and tight list, they say. But under that list, there is another paragraph and which says that if this list is to be applied, uh, it should be taken into account which legitimate expectation an investor would have had because um, promises had been made by whomever in writing or orally, you, that doesn't matter. And, and, and if those promises have then been frustrated, that's the measure that should be applied. So, so if this list is, is tight 
and, and fixed. And then you have this paragraph of legitimate expectation that, that led Markus Krajewski, one of the few independent experts, many of the experts are arbitration panelists, arbitration judges themselves. So this, this person said he was not able to, would not be able to explain to his student what that meant. It's a miserable code, but it gets even more miserable. Here we have the EU-Singapore free trade agreement. Nobody knows that. It's finished, it's negotiated, it's, it's uh, waiting to be implemented. It could be ratified at any moment, but the ratif or get into the ratific ratification process, but it could also be given to the European Court of Justice um, for them to decide whether th this is what they call a mixed agreement, meaning whether each member state has to ratify it as well, which would be the case in a mixed agreement. So this question is pending. Whether the EU Commission can ratify this agreement directly or, or will go to the EU European Court of Justice, we don't know. But what I find particularly interesting, juicy in this agreement is that the definition what an investor is is significant, significantly different to the definition in the CETA agreement, the Canadian European one. There it says that if you have property, uh, shares, um, uh, fracking could be property, and, and if you have that, you could go to those, you, you could raise that procedure. But uh, in addition, formally, you have to prove that there is a relevant business in the country that you have, not just some, some post box, but there have to be people there, at least formally, working at the site of that post box. But in the Singapore agreement, that is not the case. All that you need is owning shares. Investors can be anyone, and Singapore neatly is a tax haven as well. There are hundreds of thousands of post boxes there to add another one there, and that's why exclusively I have the great business tip for you, but please give me 5% if, if I tell you, please. Okay, agreed. Um, the business tip is this. In the state of Baden-Württemberg in southwest Germany, just opened some internet company, started internet company, any kind of sh shack. And then you go to PricewaterhouseCoopers or any other consultancy firm and let them give uh, create a holding for you or, or get a share in a holding. That saves you taxes and you can then use this agreement as well. And, and you then... Uh, Refer to item C and, and sue the state of Baden-Württemberg for damages. Uh, your expectations have not been fulfilled because the uh, broadband, broadband bandwidth isn't enough or whatever. Just select anything at all. And and as proof for the disappointed expectations, you use that famous advertisement from the Baden-Württemberg state which said we can do everything apart from standard German, and that will give you damages. With this code, that is perfectly possible. And another hint, we did say that uh, these arbitration judges would take about a thousand euros per hour or something, which is a bit much, admittedly, but there is a solution for that. There are, there are business models for business, for people like you, perhaps. And this is that investors can say, we will actually loan you the money if your case looks promising, but we'll get 20 or 40 percent from the, the gains, as it were. So that's the less good news, I have to say. Uh, about costs of a, a, a procedure like this, there is a cost calculator. Uh, ask Google or Meta, Gear, the other search engine or whatever. You'll find it quite easily, and uh, you can then calculate. Here you see uh, a one million damage sum, a three-person arbitration panel, m medium complexity European tariffs, which are not the most expensive ones. So one million is the value of the procedure, and what's this? Oh, 1.2 million cost. That can't be true. Uh, well, it is true. And our economy minister, Sigmar Gabriel, says, that these uh, agreements would benefit small and medium enterprises. Yes, of course, immediately uh, obvious, of course. And normally, in front of a court, if you are given, uh, if if they rule in your favour, and normally you wouldn't you won't have to pay costs. 
with these arbitration panels, of course, is different. How else could it be? There are many, many decisions in which states had to defend themselves against completely absurd demands. Um, and they still had to pay millions of, of costs uh, from tax money, of course, from taxpayers' money. Okay, let's change the subject, shall we? We also looked at these agreements um, from, a ne from a, an internet politics um, point of view. This and in the negotiations on this agreement, there were um, were people from Google and Microsoft. And I can't stress enough how important these uh, meetings are for lobbyists. Maybe one or another of you knows about these um, these meetings. They're, they're terrible. The ideal case is that you don't have to go to them at some point because your view of how the reality should look has become law. And these agreements, TTIP for instance, or TSAR or CETAR, are unique opportunities for all these tired lobbyists for, to, to definitely um, get revenge for all these lost cases because um, arbitration courts um, can just circumvent all these all these all these cases and the reason why um, privacy is is um, like in the crosshairs of lobbyists is that um, they'll cause lots and lots of new debates in courts and these would come into come into effect immediately the new um, the, the new um, laws that are being passed in the EU and one of them would m make th would mean that if people use sensitive data they have to they have to um, use them inside Europe and save them inside Europe they mustn't leave the continent and they must um, must get privacy experts to to agree on them <laughs> The interesting thing is that officially the European Union doesn't have a mandate to um, to talk about privacy, but instead what they do is they talk about free data flows and intra interoperability, and that doesn't sound too bad. And nobody nobody would argue against that, but the reality is that these that. Um, these are working against the hard facts that are supposed to, um, of, of privacy law. And especially for TTIP, we can have a look at the uh, leaked details of some, some portions. It wants to um, pose, impose strict limits on what countries, what states are allowed to do with um, with personal data. And a similar clause already exists in an existing agreement in the one between South Korea and the European Union. And at that time, the European Union, uh, interestingly enough, went to South Korea and told them that we don't like that banks have to notify customers when they save data outside the country. We don't like that. And we're going, we're going to remind you of that clause. And funnily enough, the, uh, the law was retracted afterwards. So people weren't too sure how, you know, if it would stand in front of a court. That means that if 
it gets passed in the way it stands, it's, it's on the paper here, then it will definitely have impact on privacy. And of course, the European Commission always says, you know, have a search the text, there's privacy written all over it. And yes, it says things like each party shall adopt appropriate safeguards for the protection of privacy and fundamental rights, la di da. It doesn't say they have to, it just says they should. It, it doesn't say what appropriate safeguards are. Ask a US, um, ask a US judge, he'd say, yeah, well, then the Fourth Amendment for doesn't isn't valid for for um, EU citizens. But not only in privacy it gets a bit ugly. In also in copyright matters, and a comparison has been drawn often between ACTA and TTIP. And interestingly, the EU really doesn't want these comparisons to be drawn. Because in all these cases, it's a sad fact that the uh, current regulations on privacy will be um, will be cemented, will be solidified. We can't say a lot about TTIP on copyright, but as for CETA, there's a you can say. You can say it's pretty bad <laughs> because the status quo of copyright will be um, will be will remain the same for for lots and lots of years. You know, even 20 years later, you can still sue based on these laws. So, if one day we have the lucky occasion to um, get a get a you know have a parliamentary uh, majority in favour of uh, copyright revolution, then we could pass that. But it's going to get really expensive, and this will, of course, um, lessen the incentives. Now we are showing a small movie, showing what the um, other side has to say about that. No sound, apparently. <laughs> uh, so apparently nobody switched on sound, so we can't show the movie. So we'll tell you what it's about. Karl Kurt was interviewed by TV. He's a uh, EU um, commissioner. And was asked how many uh, employment, how much employment TTIP would give. How much progress? Uh, Thank you very much for having us. How much economic growth will there be with TTIP? Commissioner, we are talking about TTIP. It's a great project. What effects do you hope to get from TTIP? You start? Yes. Okay. Then if you would, if you would um, look at me. Um, um, yeah. Also, bitte sehr. Jetzt. So, there you have it. What effects, what effects do you expect from TTIP? TTIP is by far the, uh, the biggest uh, uh, trade negotiation bilateral trade negotiation that the European Union ever has been uh, uh, doing. And uh, if we get to a result, uh, this would, could have a dramatic effect, I believe, for the European economy, directly and indirectly, directly uh, because it will create uh, a lot of uh, new economic activity, uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs, additional income for our citizens. But I believe that indirectly it will also strengthen our economy uh, on, a, uh, on a global scale. Um, if you join up the two biggest economies in the world, which are the United States and ourselves, 
By the way, we are the biggest European Union. That uh, represents about 50% uh, of the world economy. Now, you can expect that the next big battle on trade is about norms, standards, uh, subsidies. Ah, yes. Who tells you that the TTIP will create, as you said, hundreds of thousands of jobs? Where do you know that from? Um, well, we are not simply inventing that, you know. So we have uh, asked an independent study, and that's uh, the result they are uh, arriving at. Uh, the study also says that uh, it would mean 545 euros uh, for a, a household. Now, I don't think you can figure this out up to uh, 5 or 10 euros uh, uh, close, you know, but it, it's obvious that it could have a beneficial effect also on the income of citizens and also on economic growth. And it will, yes. I, I'm pretty sure that it will create hundreds of thousands of jobs. You should not forget that already now owned by Americans and vice versa. It's about the same. Because um, it will not be easy, but, but also in the United States. Ah. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, let's maybe it's stick to the effects. You were referring to the study of the Commission. I take it's the CPR. No, it's a, it's a study. It's a CPR. The CPR study. Been, it's a study that has been ordered by the Commission. We have not been doing it ourselves. Okay. But um, what does the study say? The study says um, it will be after the TTIP is done, it will be a, a 0.5 percent growth in GDP, in European GDP, in 10 years, which means it's 0 0.05 points every year. That's not a big effect, as you called it. Um. So, yes, more translation. <laughs> TTIP will bring 0.05% more growth, but over 10 years take together, accumulated, so it's not actually a very much. So it's 0.5% over 10 years, 0.05% per year, or something like that. Plus, the study on which he works doesn't say anything about jobs. So the study that he's presented didn't say anything about employment opportunities. This study by CPR is based on an economic model that's an economic balancing model based on uh, offer and uh, demand. And so everything will balance each, each other out and there is no unemployment in this model. And so there's obviously also no uh, no gain of employment opportunities. Now we have a new European Commission. Guch uh, didn't sell himself very well, so we have a new face of the EU Commission, Cecilia Malmström, also known as Cecilia for censorship, when in her old job, so now she is head of market, DG Market. So now they're doing all into, uh, very much into transparency. Then you Twitter account. And we now we see a website. The facts on one hand, facts of the EU Commission. And on the other hand, we have the fears. That's always the fears that we presented to you in the half, last half hour. Like the. Well, the thing with fears is that, you know, you have to call the psychiatrist or something like that. And so in theory, you should deal with that in a good way as a commission. But that's actually not what they want to do, because that's a lot of work. And they don't actually still don't actually answer the important questions, like why do we even need those agreements? So it's not for economic growth, apparently. That's only homeopathic. So we can add to that that if the new studies by John Ricapaldo at Tufts University is not true, that uh, a lot of jobs in Europe would be lost, then we can be glad even. Right, and on with... Um, so 
We have this campaign against TTIP, TTIP that we started last year in December last year. In spring, we had more than 400,000 signatures against TTIP. And in May, there was a negotiation pending in Washington. I wanted to go there. And because I am a German citizen, I do. I applied for the waive visa waiver regulation. I was surprised that they asked me to apply for a visa. Uh, and truthfully, I said that uh, the resistance against TTIP was the, the um, intention, uh, the purpose of the journey. And I was invited to go to Dahlem in, in Berlin. Um, asked to switch off all my electronic devices. Can you imagine being without electronic devices for three hours? Uh, I had an interview with an official from the Department of Homeland Security who asked me why I wanted to go there. And I said, well, this is a meeting of civil rights organization. It's, uh, the purpose is to, to, to move against TTIP. And he asked me, did you ever have problems with the police? And uh, out of a clear conscience, I said, no. And then he asked, and what was in 1981 at the border to Switzerland? It's no joke. What was that, he asked. And I admit, yes, I have been living. I was living in 1981. I was alive. I was 16, 33, 33 years ago. I was with three people in a car, driver, co-driver, and I was a passenger. And next to me was a piece uh, a, piece of dope and as it as you would have to expect we were stopped and uh, hours of interviews with driver and co-driver never heard anything about that since then until that day in Dalim and how they had digitized that I have no idea you probably know better than I do and as a souvenir of that memorable interview, I was given a blue piece of paper that you see scanned up here. The visa, the, the visa was not granted, and uh, there was a cost of 120 euros to my employer and eight hours of lost work time. And then Maretta really was really, really furious, and I can tell you, you do not want Maretta to be furious at you. Yeah, um, yeah. And then we said, all right, it's the European election campaign. The elections are coming up in May, and that is kind of boring. And there's not really an, an issue. So let's invent an issue. TTIP would be a great one. And we made TTIP an issue in the European election campaign. With this tool uh, that you see here, a nice piece of software that we developed. With that, you could choose streets and check whether someone would distribute leaflets there, and if not, enter yourself and ask for these door hangers and uh, hang those on door handles. Uh, they would list all parties with an assessment of their position in the European elections. Uh, there was uh, thumbs, well, a medium thumb for the Social Democrats, thumbs down for the CDU, CSU, the, the Christian Democrats, green thumb, thumbs up for the Greens, Pirates, and the FDP, the Liberals. Do you remember those? They went out of Parliament in 2013. They had a, what did they have? Thumbs up, thumbs down, I can't see. So uh, that made TTIP an issue in the election, cam election campaign, and we were quite surprised when the first time we met Martin Schulz, the leader of the Social Democrats in the European Parliament, he had a position paper ready f about TTIP. He was quick with that, and you tell me, uh, tell us what, how it went on. Uh, you'll have to remember, uh, just imagine being in Martin's shoes for a while. I don't know if you want to do that or can do that, but he is known as a um, proponent of proponent of data retention, and I had a bit of a confrontation with him due because of that. But I thought, well, he's smiling at us so neatly from the, from the posters, and uh, one of those said, "A Europe of people, not of money." So that should mean we c should be able to talk to him, right? So I went to Martin Schulz. Uh, as a sideline, he is a president of the European Parliament, but of course, obviously, cleanly separates that from his role as a leader of the Social Democrat group. 
So you traveled to Aachen in Western Germany, uh, in an invitation from the local Social Democrats. You have a written paper, press are there, sausages are ready, as you would expect from a Social Democrat meeting. And then you have your speech, you, you, you give your speech, and for the first time the word democracy occurs. And you do know that that word will come up a bit more often, and there are those kind of people there, you know? This is, of course, not Katharina's speech, but the one held by Martin Schulz, and the posters were from the T protesters. For us, it was perfect, because we did not have to invite the press. The SPD had done that. These press people just had to turn around. And we were not just in Aachen with that. Martin Schulz had appearances. Well, he said to himself, well, that went badly. Let's just go to Hanover. And that didn't go that well either. And Berlin. and in Dortmund we were as well. And how did we do that? We collect, we do not just collect signatures for our online petitions, we inform people as well if there are events on the ground. And that's what makes politicians really angry, particularly from the Christian socialists, so the Bavarian Christian Democrats. If people appear that are not just are there not, not those lefty people from Berlin, but actually local people from Bavaria holding up banners? That really annoys them. There was just one time when we were thrown out, and that was in Brandenburg when there was a straw bale festival. They probably do not know of demonstration law yet. Um, because this is a free expression of opinion uh, at an event. Uh, in the open, so there is no uh, law uh, enabling them to, to claim this their space from which they can evict you, just a tip for you. Uh, we did the same with the Christian Democrats, who are less ready to hold open-air events these days, uh, so less easy to, easy to troll. Um, we not, did not just pursue the party heads, we thought, uh, actually, the thing, the idea about parties is that the base has the power, but it should be a bit of a, it, it's probably a bit of a dream, but I still have that dream, and it, it's worthwhile remembering people in parties to, to stop their own uh, figureheads and uh, leave that, not leave that reminding to us, but to the people in the party. So we went to party events and, and uh, had targeted information. We had pretzels in Bavaria. Uh, red trousers with the Social Democrats. These people have some kinds of expectations, and there are lobby booths uh, over and over there. Uh, and also for free, there was a brochure that we handed out, an independent study about TTIP, with a lot of information about its effects locally in in uh, this, in local um, communities and. This is really effective before the grand speech held by the party heads and even the, uh, and the Social Democrats as well as the Christian Democrats said, uh, the party base said they did not want these ISDS tribunals. But the problem is that this hasn't really permeated through to, to the top and there is still work to be done. And that's because uh, that's why there's a multitude of further actions. We have our best of of tools here, uh, of props. What you see up there is the Canadian Parliament, where we went with our CETA hammer. It's very, it's, it's, you can ins very nicely install this on top of a Parliament building, um, and um, visualize governments under the hammer. And it's very interesting with Canada in particular, because there's this procedure there going on. Um, a company that is involved in fracking has been buying concessions or permits, so they had expectations. And then the citizens came along, and they, they were as bold to say, we do not really, we're not that, that sure about fracking. There's not so much good that you hear, so we'll have a mor moratorium on that. And uh, a Canadian company um, invoked NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and they had a subsidiary in the US. So that enabled them to pursue their own government, sue their own government. Exactly. 
Ja, ähm, ja. jetzt ist es ein Monat her, da gab es eine denkwürdige... It's been a month now since a very memorable speech, you may have heard it, from Sigmar Gabriel, the politician, and he said, we can't de reject CETA now. There's, it's only Germany where there's protests against the, uh, these agreements. The rest of Europe is, is embracing them, and the uh, Minister of Commerce of Economy says that, but we can disprove it. And in order to do that, we started a, a citizen's initiative, a European citizen's initiative. And we initially wanted to uh, create an official one, and you have to write 200 characters, and you have to use a special software from the European Union, but it's worthless. And then you have to certify. We wrote our own, and we had to certis get it certified. And finally, you need a million signatures, and you have to get a certain, um, reach a certain quota in more than seven countries. And finally, if you've done all that, you get some warm words from the European Commission. But they didn't even allow us that, and they rejected it. And thought that was the end of it but we were we told ourselves no we can do it without the European Union we sued them and we started our own um, citizens initiative and we have after two months we got more than one million we reached the quota in seven countries right now we're at 1.2 million in nine countries and we need some more signatures and then we'll have the 10th country, Ireland, as well. That's just the beginning, though. We're, ca we're carrying on, at least up until the next million, and after Juncker, after we spoiled Juncker's 60th birthday in Brussels, and this will have been the only the only topic in all the European midi media, we are going to continue doing that. We've got loads more on our plate. What you can see here is a grassroots movements, movement that's really been carried out in, in many European countries, and it's starting to bubble up to the top. And these are two maps. You can, you can see them on our website. And it shows how it, uh, how it looks on a regional basis as well. Interestingly, many uh, CDU and SPD mayors have uh, have have started to realize that these aren't really uh, these these agreements aren't really in um, in citizens' best interests, and more and more resolutions are coming up in Germany that um, object to these, and it's the same in France. And Interestingly, TTIP and CTAP are mixed uh, agreements, so not only the European Commission can sign it for us, but it's also um, it's also necessary that uh, the individual countries vote on these laws. A mixed agreement therefore means that all European member countries have to agree on it. And that's where the first problem crops up. So Sigma Gabriel saying that we can't we can't make an exception for Germany, that's simply not true. And it, it's happened before. And I'm I'm telling this to all members uh, all the members of German Parliament, you can do it as well. Yeah. Yeah. So what's what's the result that we draw from that, the conclusion? So Christmas holidays, we're looking forward to work again. It may it's a lot of fun. We can't go to the US, but we have a lot to do here. 
have a lot of good um, we have good intentions good intentions for the new year 150,000 people uh, made we uh, joined the consultation for we did. If you're in Berlin, uh, on the 17th of January, there will be a big demo big yeah, that you can join, and please do so. And, uh, well, we will engage with TTIP more and hope we'll, it will have a lot, make a lot of waves. And in May, there is going to be a resolution by the European Parliament about these um, uh, arbitration clauses in free trade and trade agreements and so we're looking forward to what the European Parliament will decide. We have a, a, a mandate by some million people to, to continue our work and we like doing that. But so with all the other activists we would like to give you some lessons to, to show. So online tools are really great, but offline to offline activities and tools are also really important and really necessary because you know politicians live a lot offline, so you really need those offline things like the door hanger we printed and handed out. And yeah, that was only possible through people getting up and putting out those flyers. So a little bit of rage and um, commitment is really helpful and necessary. And try to form broad and wide alliances, alliances bet between different NGOs. That helps a lot, and we, that helps us a lot. We have like civil society associations, uh, consumer rights associations, cultural associations. Farmers associations, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you said, didn't you? And a lot of synergies between all those associations. Uh, so that's really a good mix. Only th through these structures and these technologies, we can uh, work effectively and hopefully prevent the worst. So in that sense, I think we kind of enlightened uh, you a bit on these trade agreements, and I hope next year we can uh, drink to drink to the, the abolishment of trade agreements or the plans for them, and help hopefully can focus on uh, making pe people's lives better. Actually. Yeah, vielen Dank. So, thank you very much for the talk. We have a few minutes left for questions. I can't see anyone lining up at the microphones. Ah, here's the first person. And the internet has questions as well. Let's start with the internet. So the internet asks, it has a lot of feedback. Thousands of questions. Think you probably can't do. Can we still uh, prevent TTIF and CTAF? Please leave the room quietly. Can the EU Parliament still prevent them and what can we still do realistically? Well, the EU Parliament can prevent it. The national parliaments can do so as well. What we realistically can do is to keep the pressure up, particularly on our German members of parliament and our German parliamentarians in the EU. They're all online, they, they, they all have websites. Why don't you just go to the um, surgery, the, the, the date, the official meeting uh, with your local MP and uh, tell him or her, if you are going to reject this agreement, I might vote for you. That is what really gives them, an, uh, has an impression on them. That, um, and what's the timeline for this? From now until the end of the year, in principle, at any time for the European members of parliament, the members of the European parliament, 
It's particularly important at the end of April, beginning of May, before the, this resolution will be voted on. And I'd like to add that even agreements that have been signed already, there have been hundreds of such agreements, uh, investor state protection agreements. It's often the case that the Global North is trying to sue the Global South into the ground uh, if they notice that the, if, if these countries notice that the neoliberal recipe won't working, and these could be cancelled. These agreements could be cancelled, but you then would have to deal with investors still trying to sue after the uh, contracts have been cancelled. But the earlier, the better. Question from microphone one. Hi. Thanks for your work. Quick question. What's your position for the rest of the content of these agreements? If arbitration clause will be taken out, are you still against them? We are still against those agreements, even without ISDS, Investor State Dispute Settlement, uh, because there are problems in the area of services. Uh, there's a threat of a large uh, wave of privatization. And with all these agreements, there's the high risk that other areas, such as environmental protection, um, food safety, uh, agriculture, uh, the wheel will be turned back and uh, necessary progress might be prevented uh, because the status quo is not always that nice and would have to be, uh, would, might get solidified, cemented. We are simply cutting what we can do as a democracy. We, we are curtailing our democ democratic means, uh, our ability to say after the fact maybe liberalization uh, has gone too far. And, and if you then have clauses in these agreements that prevent decisions that have once been taken to be taken back, uh, that, in my view, is wrong. And it's wrong to uh, leave this to our ancestors uh, sorry, to our descendants, um, uh, a state that a state of things that has proved to be not helpful. Oh, well, let, just let Oliver ask his question. Thank you. Thank you to you two for your great work. Great work by Compact. I think nobody's going to doubt that. I'm also a member of the EU Council of the European Council Committee of, of the State Parliament of North Rhine Westphalia. The, the speaker of the, of the Christian and, Democrats. And the local Christian Democrats have promised to join us on the streets. Uh, Isn't it time for the next level against TTIP and against uh, work of agreement. If you look at the structure of the Commission, like you don't have to be surprised that, uh, that about the results. If, like, with all the lobby organizations and who's working for PricewaterhouseCoopers and so on. So they all already can working for them. Wouldn't it be also interesting for people interested in uh, internet politics, internet governance? And and the uh, monetary networks and what's what's compact plans in this? Uh, okay, thanks a lot. I'll have to get myself cloned and uh, yeah. Well, seriously, um, we can we cannot do everything we would like to. We will. Evaluate ideas towards EU Europe, but we cannot promise anything. Fundamentally, we are ready. We are willing to uh, look at economic conditions at a, on a, at a larger scale. We have a, a few things we'd like to do, um, uh, such as um, resolutions, uh, petitions, uh, um, direct democracy, and, and some of our people are also co-founders of Attack Germany, so there is a link uh, with the uh, movement that is critical of capitalism and globalization. Bitte und auch keine Co-Referate. Danke. Yeah.
noch eine abschließende Frage. One last question, please, and then the time is up. Also ich danke jetzt nicht, Kemp hat ausführlich für die großartige Arbeit und quasi großartige. So I'm not going to thank you again because I worked there themselves, but worked there myself. But yes, Oliver, that's right. ISDS problematic. Thanks for this uh, presenting that again. Isn't it the right time right now to kill the existing ISDS? agreements where we already have a lot of them that the German Republic signed? Well, I have this kind of domino theory. I believe uh, that if ISDS will be taken out of the agreements that are pending now, then this whole system probably as a whole will begin to slide. And, and that's what I keep saying uh, to those that say uh, we have to have ISDS because the whole system is so badly regarded and, and it's been so much abused in recent years. Uh, so those that say the whole system will fall apart and we cannot can no longer have investor state disputes with developing countries. But so, so I say as soon as we kill this, uh, the time is ripe to to really kill ISDS as a whole, um, but we'll have to take use another time for that. And also I believe that currently there is an interesting counter movement if you look at the successful procedures and, and, and the amounts of, of damages, um, these agreements have been in place for a long time. It, it, usually it was the case that the North insisted on these agreement, on that in the agreements with the Global South, saying that our investors will not uh, be willing to invest if they're under protections, although there has been no proof for that. But in the last few years, more and more um, procedures have uh, surfaced where investors have turned th 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 things around and say we could, said we can sue, sue another way and then sue the rich countries too, because there might be more to gain there too. And there have been procedures like Vattenfall, the Swedish electricity supplier, against the German energy change policy. And and the more procedures like that we have, and, and the more they are debated and noticed by parliamentarians, the more there will be willingness to uh, question that whole system. Thank you. That's all the time we have. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Again, ap apologies for the late start. Uh, our speakers have been Sebastian and...